Welcome to Opal STV. Today I'm in New York together with Don Steinbrugge. Don is the CEO of Agecroft Partners. He has over three decades of experience raising assets from institutional investors and he also headed up institutional sales for two of the largest global asset management companies. So Don, please tell us more about your background and what you're doing right now with Agecroft Partners. Thanks for the warm introduction. Just to give a little bit more detail on my background, I'm now in my 34th year in the investment management industry. And before founding Agecrawl Partners 10 years ago, you know, some of the prominent roles I had in the industry were heading up institutional sales for what is now Bank of America Capital Management. At the time, we were the 18th largest money manager in the world. And basically, my responsibility was uh, heading up sales to uh, pension funds, endowment funds, foundations, large family offices to sell the internal investment capabilities of that organization. I was also head of institutional sales for Merrill Lynch Investment Managers. At the time, they were the third largest money manager in the world. And again, the, the same target market, large pensions, endowments, foundations, family offices. I left Merrill. I became a, a founding principal of a hedge fund called Andor Capital Management. We peaked as the second largest hedge fund in the world, and at Andor, I was head of sales, marketing, client service, and I also served on the operating committee. I then retired for a few years, moved down to Virginia, uh, got bored, and about 10 years ago, uh, decided to start Hcroft Partners. We're a hedge fund marketing firm that basically goes global. There's a total of five partners at our firm, and we typically represent you know, five to six hedge funds at a time. We also write a number of thought pieces in, on the industry, on trends we see, and we put on a conference called uh, Gaining the Edge uh, Hedge Fund Investor Leadership Summit that has sold out the past three years. We get about 650 people come, and basically the model of the conference is to help educate investors. We only allow uh, prominent allocators to hedge funds speak on panels. What is the market environment like today for hedge funds trying to raise assets? How competitive is it and where are the assets actually coming from? The hedge fund industry is probably the most competitive industry there is. We estimate there's about 15,000 hedge funds. And when you think about it, you know, investors use a funnel approach to selecting hedge funds. So most prominent hedge fund allocators are being contacted by uh, thousands of hedge funds a year. They're meeting with 500, they're doing second meetings with 50, and they're allocating to two. So in order to get business in the hedge fund industry, you have to have a very, very strong product and you have to effectively be able to articulate what your differential advantages are across each of the evaluation factors investors use to select a hedge fund. And if there's any flaws in any aspect of your product, you're just not gonna get hired. You know, as far as how competitive the industry is, one of the things that makes it even more competitive is the fact that it's a mature industry. You know, e each year the net flows to the industry are plus or minus, you know, 2% of the three trillion plus assets, most of the assets being allocated to hedge funds are actually coming from redemptions from other uh, hedge funds. So it's a takeaway business. So you mentioned the criteria that institutional investors have when they allocate to hedge funds. I wonder how much harder is it for smaller hedge funds to raise assets? It's a lot harder for smaller hedge funds to raise assets. There was a study done by Prequent, and this is a little dated, this came out last year, but it basically said that 75% of flows were going to hedge fund managers with over five billion in assets, 90% of flows were going to hedge funds with over a billion in assets, and less than 2% of flows were going to managers with less than 100 million in assets. And when you think of the 15,000 hedge funds, a vast majority of them have less than 100 billion in assets. So 
a majority of hedge funds are going after 2% of assets. You know, but part of the reason is the makeup of the hedge fund investor has evolved over time. You know, from 2000 to 2008, most flows were going to fund of funds, family offices, high net worth individuals. And since then, uh, pension funds, endowments, foundations, sovereign wealth funds have been dominating asset flows. And a lot of those investors are looking for larger managers to allocate to. So to be successful for a, a smaller manager, you know, it's important that you excel at all the things that allocators are looking for and you got to work a lot harder to build your brand. So Don, what do you think, let's say, the three things that a hedge fund really needs to succeed and stay in business irrespective of the size? You know, the, I think any hedge fund can be successful raising assets if they excel at three things. The first thing they have to have is a superior product and it has to rank well across each of the factors investors use to select a hedge fund. You know, one of the big issues I think in the hedge fund industry is many hedge fund managers have no idea how investors select hedge funds and they think it's all about performance. And I can tell you it's not all about performance. You know, for performance tends to be a, a hurdle that you have to be above. And once you're above that specific hurdle, then all these other factors investors focus on are almost equally important to performance. The second thing you have to have is a, a strong marketing message. You know, there, another problem I think within the hedge fund industry is those hedge fund managers that have a strong product are not very good at articulating what their differential advantages are. And what happens is the reality of the quality of the product is different than the perception that the investor has. And if the investor's perception is below reality, the hedge fund manager is not going to get hired. And I think the final thing a hedge fund needs to raise money is distribution. You know, if you have a great product and you have a great marketing message and no one knows about it, assets are not going to come. You know, if you, you put your, num your performance in um, a hedge fund database and sit back and wait for investors to come, they just don't come. You know, it's too competitive. You have to go out, you have to build a brand, you got to meet with a bunch of investors. And if you do that, and you have a strong product, and you have a strong marketing message, assets will come and you can be successful. So Don, you mentioned three factors that are relevant. One is selection criteria of investors. The second one is the actual perception of hedge funds as an industry. And then thirdly, the sales and marketing procedure of a hedge fund. Let's look at these three factors in more detail. Let's start with the selection criteria of investors. So what factors are investors looking at? What is important for them? As I mentioned before, performance is important, but it isn't the driving reason why investors allocate to a hedge fund. You know, before I, I mentioned 75% of assets were going to hedge funds with over $5 billion in assets. A lot of those hedge funds that are getting assets don't have the top performance in the particular strategy that they're focusing on. You know, the reason people are allocating to them is because, you know, they're big, they have a lot of people, they have well-defined investment processes. So just taking a step back, performance is a hurdle that performance has to be above. You know, you probably need to be or have a track record in the top 20% of your peer group to even be considered. If you don't, you know, it's almost impossible to raise money. Once you do, then people are going to look at the other factors that they use to evaluate hedge funds. And one is the organization. And the organization encompasses a lot of different things. You know, for, first of all, the absolute minimum is the hedge fund organization has to have someone who is not the investment professional running the organization and who is able to pass an operational due diligence exam. You know, other things relative to the organization are just, you know, how many people do you have employed? What is the experience someone has when they come to your office? You know, I, I'm shocked when I go to some hedge fund offices and they're in some 
you know, lousy office building, the furniture doesn't look good, you know, they're trying to save money because their revenues aren't very high. The only problem with that is when people come to the office, it affects their perception. And when you consider how competitive the hedge fund industry is, you want people walking away from the meeting with a very positive view of the organization. The second thing people look at is the investment team and the quality of the investment team. And most importantly, what, what experience that investment team has that allows them to focus on the particular asset class and have expertise in that particular asset class. So, you know, people's bios is very important. Where they worked before, what school they went to, how many people are on the team. And, you know, often if you add a couple analysts and you build out the quality of the investment team, it can be the difference between, you know, getting assets and not getting assets. You know, I think the most important factor that people look at is the investment philosophy and process. You know, what inefficiency is it in the marketplace that the hedge fund manager is trying to take advantage of? And what is their differential advantage to capture that inefficiency? If people don't understand that, it is very unlikely that they're going to invest. You know, again, track record is historical performance. What people are buying is future performance. And if they can clearly understand the inefficiency in the marketplace and your differential to capture that inefficiency, they are much more likely to be confident that the uh, performance going forward will be good and thus allocate to your fund. You know, risk controls are very important. And it's really important to understand what the demand is in the marketplace because people can have a, a very strong investment process, they can generate alpha in the securities they select, but if, they, if the way they put the securities together isn't creating a product that investors want to buy, they may not be able to sell the product. So risk controls are, are, are part of it is making sure you reduce your, your tail risk in your portfolio, making sure you're diversified, making sure uh, the, the strategy doesn't have too much volatility. But there's also other things that you need to think about. You know, what is the expected return for the strategy? You know, I remember back uh, around 11 years ago, we were representing a, a market neutral fund and they had a very strong st sharp ratio. They were doing a great job through security selection. You know, when they came to Agecroft, their only issue was that the performance they were generating was below what the market was looking for. You know, they, they were generating about a 7.5% return. Back then, people were looking for a 9% return to hire a manager. And we ended up doing is adding a, a 2x version to their fund. It was basically a feeder that was levered two times. And what that gave people was, you know, expected return in the 14 to 15% range, which, which was exactly what people wanted. This sharp ratio obviously stayed the same because it was the same, you know, underlining portfolio that it was allocating to. And we were able to raise a lot of assets because we were able to provide the market with something that they were looking to. You know, another example is, um, you know, there's some long short equity managers that have very long biases. There was one who I thought was an outstanding stock picker, which we decided not to represent. And the main reason was that their net exposure would go well over 100%. And when you look at the market for hedge funds, the, the demand drops off significantly once you st start getting above a net exposure of 60. So if, you're, if you have a net exposure below 60, you know, most people allocating the long short equity might be interested in what you do. If your net exposure is 90, you know, you're probably going after you know, 10 to 20% of the universe of investors that like long short equity. You get over a net exposure of 100, and you're probably only looking at 5% of the marketplace. So sometimes altering your risk controls to, to focus on what people are looking for can have a, a significant impact on the demand for your product. Service providers are obviously important. The business is all about brand. You know, if you don't have one of the top service providers, law firms, prime brokers, accounting firms, it's a reason for people to take a pass on your fund. And then finally, you know, fund terms are important. There's a lot of pressure on fees. If you're a smaller hedge fund manager, you might want to consider, you know, founder share until the fund gets up to one or 200 million. I think the bar for, for 
Founder share fees is being raised from an asset standpoint. It used to be 100. I'm beginning to see people now continue founder share fees to 150, 200. And before you go out in the marketplace, I would recommend making sure that you have a superior product because first impressions only happen once. You know, if you go out first, people have issues. It's a lot harder to go back a second time and say, hey, we've changed things, we're now better. So this brings us to the topic of perception. I mean, today, everyone can read on any given day something about hedge fund in the press or in the internet. We're living in the age of billions where people can watch the TV series, etc. But there is still this huge gap between the perception of hedge funds and the reality of the quality of a hedge fund. I wonder, how can a professional investment manager, a hedge fund, construct the marketing message in a way so that it's really helpful and that it closes this gap between reality and the, and the real quality of an organization? So one of the things I learned when I was head of institutional sales for what is now Bank of America, at the time it was uh, Nations Bank, is that the, the typical model for institutional salespeople was to have a, a portfolio manager present in front of the sales force and explain what they did and have the sales force write down notes and then they go off and they would talk to you know large pensions endowments consultants and try to repeat what the portfolio manager said and what i found was that if you sat each of those salespeople down in front of a video camera and had them do their presentation you would find huge discrepancies between what each of the salespeople said and the quality of each of the salesperson presentation was probably less than what the portfolio manager's presentation was. And occasionally you'd come across some salespeople that would articulate certain aspects of the presentation better than the portfolio manager. So you did not have consistency of marketing message. You also didn't have a, a very high quality marketing message with that strategy. And that's what most investment firms did. What I decided to do was to try to increase the consistency of the message by actually scripting the message out. You know, having the portfolio manager dictate exactly what he said in the meeting, because you know, I've, I've probably done close to 10,000 meetings in my career. And you know, I've taken these portfolio managers all over the US or Europe or wherever, and you know, often they say the same thing in every single meeting outside of the question and answer period. So I realized that you know, if they're saying the same thing, the salespeople should be able to say the same thing as the portfolio manager. And if you actually put it on paper, it gives you a lot of benefits because you know, if you have a lot of people looking at what's said, different people have different opinions on, on how to improve, how things are articulated so people better understand them. Another benefit of putting stuff on paper is it's accurate. You know, the, the worst, if you're heading up institutional sales for large sales force, the last thing you want is people winging things, you know, saying things that aren't true. You want every aspect of that presentation to be highly accurate. So the keys to an effective presentation are one, making sure it's linear. You know, I told you earlier what the factors are that people use to select a hedge fund. You know, follow that order in explaining what your differential advantages are. Most of the people you're meeting with in an initial meeting are, you know, somewhat junior in an organization. They're going to take notes and they're going to have to communicate what you told them to either their superiors or other partners at the firm. And if you, a hedge fund manager is going off on a lot of tangents, it's very difficult for them to take notes and it's even more difficult for them to communicate what you do to their associates. If you take a linear approach to how you're describing your organization, it's much easier for them to take those notes and articulate it to someone else. It's also important to be very concise. You know, you want to make sure you can get your message out in 30 minutes. If you're still talking an hour and 15 minutes into a presentation, 
the presentation is not going well. So the, the most important thing is script it out, try to be consistent. Everybody at the firm should be saying the same message. And you should also, you know, try to identify what commonly asked questions are asked. You know, t typically the same question is asked over and over again, and I would suggest the same thing. Script out that question. Get a lot of people's viewpoints, you know, at the firm on what the best way is to address the question they have and make sure everybody answers the question in a consistent manner. Don, you talked a lot about the quality of a product. I wonder, if a hedge fund has a great product, will sales and asset raising happen automatically? Or what's the role of a defined marketing strategy and how should such a marketing strategy ideally be designed and implemented? Once a hedge fund has created a high quality product along with a high quality message, it's then time to go out and make sure that that message is communicated to the marketplace. And the market has changed a lot over the past 20 years. You know, Agecroft Partners only represents one out of every 150 hedge funds that we take a look at. So the managers that we typically work for are high quality managers that have you know, a very strong track record. And, you know, typically when people bring Agecroft on board to help them, you know, they're in databases and their assets are usually growing moderately, but not exponentially. And that just shows you how competitive the marketplace is. You cannot just put great numbers in a database and wait for investors to come. You know, the industry is very brand driven. And if you're going out in the marketplace, you want to try to create some type of buzz. You want to penetrate the marketplace deeply. You want to create a brand. And what I mean by that is an investor is much more likely to invest in a, a fund if they hear the name of the fund from another investor than if it's just a hedge fund manager. And the way you build that brand is by you know going back into cities and deeply penetrating the investor base in that city because the hedge fund and investor base is, is tightly knit. A lot of these people talk to each other, they go to the same conferences, they share notes, and if you have a great product and a great marketing message and you are deeply penetrating the marketplace, you will create a buzz. Another interesting thing about the hedge fund industry is asset growth is not linear. It's exponential. And why is it exponential? You know, once you meet with investors, if you're a hedge fund manager and you put them on your distribution list, they're going to follow your performance on a monthly basis. But another thing they're going to follow is your asset growth. And if they've been following you for a couple of years and you're still at the same asset growth, they're going to wonder what, what's wrong with your hedge fund? Why aren't other investors allocating to you? And they're probably not going to allocate to your fund. They're going to want someone else to allocate first. If they follow you and they see that the assets are going up every single month, that gives them confidence that other investors have done due diligence, have, have decided to allocate to you, and that makes them much more willing to invest in your fund, which is why you have this exponential growth. You know, growth brings growth of assets. So, you know, what do you do if you're you're a hedge fund manager and you want to go out and hit the marketplace. And what I just said sounds really easy, but it's not. I mean, the first thing you need to do is figure out, you know, who it is who allocates to hedge funds. So in order to do that, you know, a hedge fund either needs to hire a very experienced uh, hedge fund salesperson who's been in the business a long time, who has a, a large Rolodex. You want to leverage your prime broker cap intro area. The issue with that is, you know, they're going to introduce you to people, but the hedge fund sales process is long. You know, it typically takes three to five meetings to get a mandate. And the typical sales process is somewhere between, you know, six months or it could take a number of years. So if someone introduce you to an investor, that is very helpful, 
but someone has to follow up, you know, figure out what the next step of the process is. When do you schedule the next meeting? How do you get them to come to your office? So, you know, building brand with one sales person is very difficult. You know, typically it takes more than one salesperson to penetrate the marketplace effectively. You know, another way you can do it is by hiring a third-party marketing firm, someone like Agecroft that has a large team and can significantly, you know, ramp up the number of meetings you have, has a very large database. You can see more people in each city you go to. And you have to take a long approach. You know, once you start hitting the marketplace, you may do a lot of meetings in the first six months, very little assets may come in. But if you have a, a strong product and a strong marketing message and you are doing the volume of meetings that you need to do to build your brand, you know, eventually those assets are going to come. And as I mentioned, uh, assets are ex exponential growth. And you want to grow fairly quickly because, you know, at some point your performance may stumble and if it stumbles, you want to make sure it stumbles once you get to a size that is where you want to be versus small because a stumble in performance could put you on the sidelines from an asset raising standpoint for a period of time. Don, in your experience, how important are hedge fund conferences? And also tell us something about your own conference that you've been running for a number of years now. You know, I think attending conferences is very helpful in enhancing the brand. You know, if you're calling on investors, you can only meet with them so many times. You know, typically if they're very interested in your strategy, maybe you can meet with them once a quarter. If they're not that interested in your strategy, maybe you can meet with them once every six months to once every year. But if you go to these conferences, you know, you can see a lot of these investors that are on your pipeline. It's, it, the more you get in front of them, the higher the probability is that, that you're going to get hired. And, you know, as you're going through your, your sales process, obviously you should prioritize all your prospects, the ones that are the, have the highest probability of allocating. You should be focused on, have a strategy on what the next step is. The ones that are long-term investors, you know, you should still try to get in, in front of them at least once every six to 12 months if you happen to be going where they're going. And this whole process is enhanced by going to conferences, socializing. It's where people talk about other managers and you just want to be in the flow of the industry. So the top conferences, I think it's very worthwhile to go to because it'll significantly help the brand. You know, as far as Agecroft Conference, um, Gaining the Edge Hedge Fund Investor Leadership Summit, uh, you know, I, I think it's a very good conference for hedge fund managers to come. You know, we have 300 investors that, that come to the conference. We have 50 prominent investors that speak. You know, we've, we're going to have a number of uh, very large public pension funds on panels, corporate pension funds, endowments, foundations, some of the leading uh, hedge fund consultants. We're going to have family offices, fund of funds. The 300 investors that come to our conference, we're very careful in screening them. We require at least 50 million in AUM in order to get a complimentary invitation to our conference. You know, we tend to turn, turn away close to 100 investors that are smaller or questionable that want to attend the conference. There's going to be, you know, it's, it's very educational. We're going to have a lot of different panels that focus on what the needs are for different segments of hedge fund investors, but also panels that focus on various strategies and talking about what the strengths and weaknesses of various aspects of segments within the hedge fund industry, for example, you know, in fixed income, should you invest in structured credit, should you invest in relative fixed income, direct lending. We're also going to have a lot of time to socialize and learn from fellow professionals in the hedge fund industry. We're going to have obviously lunches, coffee breaks, cocktail parties. So the conference is a, a day and a half and I think it's um, 
a conference where you can accomplish a lot in a very short period of time. So we're still talking about asset raising for hedge funds. How important is social media for that? You know, I think social media is very important for hedge funds. As I mentioned, this industry is all about brand. And I can't mention it enough, you know, most of the assets are going to the largest managers because they have the strongest brands, not necessarily because they have the best performance. You know, social media, in particular LinkedIn, is something that large percentage of people in the hedge fund industry use. Now, if you're a hedge fund manager, you got to be very careful about general solicitation. But there are certain aspects of social media that you can do. I mean, first of all, you can become a connection with someone on LinkedIn. You know, there's nothing wrong with connecting someone. And if you do, and people go to the connections, they'll, they'll see your name. You know, you can post information that is about the industry or about the asset class. You, you can't post anything relative to trying to sell your fund or what your investment process is. But general information about the industry, you know, you can post on LinkedIn that is very thoughtful. And all of that helps keep your name in front of people within the hedge fund industry, promotes your brand. And it's been very effective for our firm. You know, we're, we're a hedge fund marketing firm. And, you know, right now I have about 37,000 followers on LinkedIn that are almost all in the hedge fund industry. And when I post something, I'm typically getting anywhere from five to 30,000 views. And it's, you know, a very powerful mechanism to communicate to a lot of people in the hedge fund industry on a regular basis. So I think it's a, a very valuable tool. I think you have to be very careful as far as what your message is, but if levered correctly, it can be very beneficial. So let's look at the allocator side again, at the institutional investor. Is there a change of sentiment that you can observe on the side of the allocators? You know, when you look at the hedge fund industry from a high level, what you'll see is that the industry assets under management have grown nine years in a row. And you'll see that last year, hedge fund assets grew all four quarters. You know, what you won't see is the large rotation of assets between various strategies. And I've seen some pretty major changes in investor sentiment over the past two years. You know, before November of 2016, you know, I think the average investor was in a risk-off mode. You know, they were looking for strategies that weren't very correlated to the capital markets. And it seems that after the U.S. elections in November of uh, 2016, the, there was a major shift and people became much more optimistic. They thought the political situation was going to favor pro-growth, the stock market took off, and people's interest in riskier strategies in increased significantly. You know, since February 1st, I've seen a, a shift back towards a risk-off mode. You know, you've seen a big increase in volatility in the capital markets. You've seen interest rates increase. So, you know, I'm seeing assets come out of hedge fund strategies that have a lot of credit exposure or, or duration in them. And on the equity side, you know, I'm, I'm seeing less interest for long short equity. The one exception to that is Asia. I think there, there is a lot of interest in Asia because Asia long short equity managers are focusing on markets that have significantly lower valuations than the U.S. markets. Also, Asia is experiencing, even though the growth rate in the U.S. is projected to be between 3 and 4 percent, you know, a number of Asia markets are growing almost double that rate. So a lot of people are under weighted in Asia. I see them increasing their allocation to Asia. IMF says two-thirds of world economic growth is going to come from Asia over the next five years. But outside of that exception, 
I, I do see money coming out of um, very long biased U.S. equity long short strategies and focusing on strategies that again aren't correlated with the capital markets. You know, we're seeing interest in strategies such as uh, commodity trading advisors, reinsurance, direct lending, relative value fixed income. And I think there's going to be strong demand for those strategies as long as the volatility continues in the capital markets. Hedge funds and alternative investments is a very entrepreneurial sector. So there are always new funds, new managers starting up. Can you sum up your advice for emerging managers? My advice would be that, uh, you know, I've talked about how competitive the industry is. But I, I do believe that if you have a strong product, you have a strong marketing message, and you have str strong distribution, that you can succeed and you can raise money in this industry. I mean, that's what we do. We've been doing it for 10 years. We've done it for a lot of different managers. The, the positive of the hedge fund industry, it is very large. It's over $3 trillion in assets. The negative is it's very competitive, and you just want to make sure that you excel in those three areas I mentioned before. And if you do, you should be able to grow your assets and reach the asset goals that you want to achieve.